Well, I too want to uh, express my appreciation to uh, the church here for inviting me to come up and to be with you and uh, for the school. And I, uh, well, I enjoy my time here. This is kind of like coming home for me. And actually, I, I got to go home last night uh, and spend some time with mom and dad. And uh, it's, it's always special to be in the High Valley. I appreciate uh, very much the invitation to be here. Um, you know, uh, my dad has been preaching at, at Chester for uh, 45 years, and uh, that's, that's a long time. And I have been at uh, Glasgow for 20 years. And uh, just recently, as some of you already know, I, I've accepted a new work um, in, in Knoxville, Tennessee with the Carnes uh, Church of Christ there. And we'll be moving uh, later in, well, next year, actually. But, uh, you know, when I finally made that decision, it was a difficult decision because we've spent 20 years at, at South Green and, and have a lot of deep roots there. But uh, I called Dad and I said, listen, here's what I'm doing. I, I think we're going to move to, to Carnes. There was a long pause, and I said, did you hear me? And he said, young man, I wish you'd quit just moving around and, and build, <laughs> you know, build some roots at a place. But, uh, no, he didn't say that. But... Uh, that's what I was afraid he was going to say, but uh, anyway, it's good to be here. And uh, the, the lesson that I have been assigned is Christ and the silence of the scriptures. I'll tell you what, I don't know of any one single issue that has more to do with uh, unity uh, than understanding the silence of the scriptures or understanding at least how... Um, the authority of Scripture works. The failure to understand the authority of the Scripture, the nature of authority, is, I believe, the greatest reason that we have a vision in the church and outside of the church. I think people want to do what's right. They want to please God. They want to go to heaven, but they don't understand this concept, this, the nature of authority. Um, and if you don't have that down, then it doesn't matter how uh, kind and, and gentle you are in dealing with other people. It doesn't matter how much you desire unity. Listen, if we don't operate by the same standard to measure something, whether it's right or wrong, true or false, truth or error, we'll never come to agreement on those, those issues. And all you have to do is just look at our own history um, just a little over a hundred years ago, in 1906, uh, for the very first time um, in the, the national census, the Christian churches and the churches of Christ were listed as separate uh, entities, separate religious organizations because of the division. Uh, Fifty years prior to that had uh, eventually culminated in, in this division. The division kind of rode out on issues like the Missionary Society and, and the use of mechanical instruments of music in, in Christian worship, but at the root of it all is this issue of authority. That's what was, we, we divided over, the issue of authority, and how that authority uh, it, it played out in those issues like instrumental music. Both sides, even today, would affirm something along this line. We speak where the Bible speaks, and we're silent where the Bible is silent. Now, we say that, but so do they. They say the same thing. That's their slogan, too. But here's the problem. We understand that statement differently. They embrace that statement just as much as we embrace that statement. But when I say we speak where the Bible speaks and are silent where the Bible is silent, and I put an issue to that, such as uh, the use of instruments of, of music in worship, I say the Bible doesn't give any authorization for it. The Bible is silent on that, and therefore I shouldn't do it. I, I just need to do what the Bible says. And so I view that as prohibitive, the silence as prohibitive. Those in Christian churches today will look at the same statement and say, yeah, I, I, I'm going to uh, believe that same thing. We speak where the Bible speaks and are silent where the Bible is silent. And when it comes to the instrument of music, well, you know what? I don't read of the instrument um, in New Testament worship. I don't read anything about 
uh, whether you should or shouldn't. The Bible's silent on that subject, and therefore we can do it. We can use it. We can proceed. You see, they view this issue of authority completely opposite of the way we do. Yet they say the same thing. The question then is, is silence. When God doesn't speak, does that give us permission to go ahead and do what we want? Or does that tell us that it's prohibited from us doing beyond what is said? That's what we have to try to figure out if we're ever going to come to unity. We have to figure out what does the Bible say about the silence of the scriptures. And I'm, I'll say this, I'm using that colloquial, colloquially, I can't even get it out. I, because really it's not about silence, it's about authority. It's about what is spoken. There, there's no authority in silence. Uh, the authority is bound up in what God said. And it's how we deal or how we view what God said that we're talking about. But let me say this too. My, the title of my lesson is Christ and the Silence of Scriptures. But we're going to be looking at some passages that aren't necessarily stated by Jesus himself. But I want to show you how that's relevant. Not too long ago, I was at a gospel meeting somewhere local, close uh, to Glasgow area. And there was a preacher that was preaching. He said, you know what? We don't spend enough time in the Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He said, in fact, I'll tell you what it's like, and he used this illustration in the sermon. He said, you know, if you're going to plug in your hair dryer in the morning in the bathroom, you, you take it and you plug it into that outlet and you have power, and it works. But if you take that plug and try to plug it into the reflection of the outlet in the mirror, there's no power. It won't work. And he said, that's how I'd like to describe. The power is in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the words of Jesus. And if we spend all of our time in Acts through the book of Revelation, if that's where we spend our focus, we'll have no power. Because the power is in Jesus, not in these other books. Well, folks, that's just, that's just not right. That's just a, a dressed up way of, well, have you ever seen or heard of anybody that, um, holds more uh, weight, those red letter words in their Bible hold more weight than the black ones because Jesus said those. Um, we, we understand that's not true either. That's just a dressed up version of that same concept. Turn in your Bible with me to John chapter 16. Let me show you something in John 16 that Jesus says. Jesus is with his uh, apostles. He's about to leave. And he says in John 16, verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. Jesus wasn't done talking, but they weren't capable of grasping all the things that he had to say. So he said, now I still have more, but you're not able to get it right now. So what's Jesus going to do about that? However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you of things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what, listen, he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, he said that, that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Listen. What God revealed to the apostles or through the apostles in the books of Acts through Revelation are the words of Jesus. They are what was his that was later delivered through the Holy Spirit. So when I turn to the epistles and say, here's what Jesus said about the silence of Scripture, it is what Jesus said, though he didn't say it in his personal ministry. So let's begin right here. Turn in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 7, and I hope you have it with you, because I want you to turn, I want you to read these things, because this is an important concept, and it, you know, unity hinges on understanding, is silence prohibitive, or is it permissive? Well, what I want us to do is look at this principle, see how it is expressed in common day, see how it's expressed in Scripture, and then let's bring some conclusions together. 
Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 14 uh, is a good illustration of the principle of silence. In Hebrews 7 and verse 14, the Bible says, For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. Now, let's just back up a little bit and let's see if we can develop this argument that the writer of Hebrews is making. In Numbers chapter 8, verses 1 through 26, God explicitly authorizes and commands the sons of Levite to be the priests. That's where this whole Levitical priesthood comes from. God said, Levi, you and your sons will be priests. Now, Paul, or, or the Hebrew writer, whoever that may have been, is affirming in this passage that Jesus is our high priest. But now how is Jesus our high priest since he came from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing? And the point that the Hebrew writer is making is this. There had to have been a change in the law. There has to have been a, a change in the priesthood because the law said Levi and his sons are to be the priests. But Jesus wasn't from the tribe of Levi, yet he was a priest. Therefore, the law have, uh, had to have changed. But here's the, the impact of that statement. The writer of Hebrews says, Since God was silent concerning Judah, it was viewed as prohibitive. He, what the Hebrew writer is saying is this, Jesus is high priest, but you couldn't be high priest unless you were from the tribe of Levi, so there had to have been a change in the law. But where in the text did God say Judah can't be priest? Where did God say that um, Simeon couldn't be a priest or Reuben couldn't be a priest? He didn't. What he did say is, Levi shall be my priest. What, what about the rest? They're prohibited. Why? Because they weren't authorized. God was silent when it came to them with respect to the priesthood. And that's the very point that God is making here in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 14. The principle of silence is illustrated right here in this passage. When somebody asks you the question, well, is silence prohibitive or is it permissive? Right here's your answer. It's prohibitive. Jesus could not have been a priest under the old system because he came from the tribe of Levi, which Moses, about which Moses spoke nothing. The fact that he said nothing would have meant he couldn't have done it. Now, let's look at some practical application of this principle. Listen. The Bible is God's communication to us, and God used words. He used, well, I mean, we use words every day. We talk to each other. We talk to our husbands, our, our wives, our children. We, we communicate, and we seem to be able to do that pretty well. Every once in a while, we'll misunderstand one another, but, <clears throat> uh, you know, far and away, we understand what we mean when we intend to communicate. Why is it that we don't apply those principles of communication to the Word of God? Because it's the same thing with reference to God. God's not trying to play tricks on us. He's communicating to us. And he's using what we use to communicate, words. We should be good at that. You know, here's the problem. We get in mind that somehow God's uh, got this secret message and that we, we put this spin on his words. It's like, can you imagine doing this in everyday life? Here's my wife. We're, we're having company and she's um, fixing to mash the potatoes. She says, oh, I'm out of milk. Steve, will you run to the store and get a, a gallon of milk? And then I stand there and go, I don't know what she means by that. <laughs> I, I think I know exactly what she means by that. I don't have to put some spin on that or try to understand that or interpret that in some way. I know exactly what she's saying. A and the same thing is true with God. I had a teacher one time at Freed, and he always said this. He said, if the normal sense makes good sense, seek no other sense, lest it result in nonsense. 
Does that, did you catch that? Because that's good. If the normal sense makes good sense, then seek no other sense lest it result in nonsense. If my wife says, go to the store and get a gallon of milk, she meant go to the store and get a gallon of milk. And if God spoke to us, he meant what he said too. Now, here, let's apply some principles of communication that we use every day. You know, I, I can't go into Walmart and buy a pair of pants or something or a, a long sleeve shirt. My, my sleeve length is too long. And, uh, you know, they, they go about to a 35 and I need a 38, okay? So I can't go in. So I have to order shirts online. Imagine placing an order. I want a white long sleeve shirt with 38 inch sleeves. Next day, two days later, five semi trucks pull up to the house and they start unloading dishwashers and washers and dryers and and women's clothes and men's clothes and uh, everything you can think, lawn mowers, everything you can think of. And, and I go outside and I say, listen, wait, what's, what's going on here? And they said, well, you placed an order with us the other day. And I said, I know, but all, I said, I, I wanted a shirt. Well, I know, and we got your shirt somewhere in there, but you didn't say that you didn't want these other things. Well, now listen, we know good and well that no, um, no store, no realtor uh, is going to, or no one's going to, a retailer is going to deal with us in that fashion. They're never going to take that kind of liberty with our orders. They're only going to give us what we have requested. And we get along and function in society with that understanding we do it every day. And then when it comes to the word of God, we throw that all out the window. Or some do, seem to. Why would we, you know, if no retailer will take such liberties with our orders, what, th what makes us think we can take such liberties with God's orders? When God says, here's what I want. And we say, well, we understood what you said, and we do that too, but we've also added a bunch of other things that you didn't explicitly prohibit. Doesn't make sense, does it? If we can see it in our daily life, why can't we see it when it comes to the Word of God? Because God used the same words that we use every day to communicate and get along with each other. He used the same words to communicate to us. Now, that's just practical, and I'm sure you've heard those examples all your life. But let's get to the text itself and look at a few examples of where this principle is spelled out. And um, without a doubt, we can see some things where silence is prohibitive. Turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 7. God is about to destroy the world by a flood. And he tells Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Now, you know, of course, it's, it's very interesting that he says, come into the ark. He didn't say go into the ark. He said, come. And the difference between come and go are the location of the one speaking. God was, have you ever heard people say, how, I don't believe that's, the, how could Noah have taken care of all those animals? You know, how are they going to take care of all that for, for a year? God was with them. I, you know, it was a miracle that there was a flood in the first place. Could miracles have been done on God's part to help Noah out in this process? Well, I don't see why not. But he says he invites Moses, no, he commands Moses to come into the ark. Moses obeys. A year passes, the waters dry up, and look at what it says in chapter 8 and verse 13. And it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and indeed the surface of the ground was dry. Now, if you didn't know what else the text says, what would you expect would happen at that point if you hadn't read ahead? You would think there would be 
eight wide-eyed people kicking the door down trying to get out of that ark to get on dry land and be back to normal. Listen, Christmas time, Thanksgiving time, when you get together with your family, you've got your three or four children together and you're living in your little space. About a week into that, what are you thinking? I wish those kids would go home. You know, I, 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 we're, we're walking over top of each other. Uh, their stuff is in our way. They're, they're, they're disrupting my routine. Imagine being in an ark for a year, not only with your in-laws and children, but with all these animals. Listen, when the day came that you could get out and leave, you can imagine they would have run out of that thing, you know, to get on dry ground. But here's what happened. Noah takes the covering off, looks out, sees that the surface of the ground is dry, but he didn't run out. Look at what the text says in chapter 8 and verse 14. And in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dried and God spoke to Noah saying, go out of the ark. It's nearly two months later and he still hadn't left the ark. Why? I'm sure they wanted out, but why didn't he leave? Because the last thing God said to him is come into the ark. That was the command of God. Does Noah have authority to leave the ark? Not until it was given to him. Could Noah just have assumed that it would be okay to leave? Could he act where God has not spoken? No. He waited for the command of God. He acted on the words of God, not on the silence of God. He waited until God said, now go out. And then he went out. That's a respect for the silence of God. Exodus chapter 20, if you have your Bible turned there, I'm sure you know what these are the Ten Commandments, but in Exodus chapter 20, one of the commandments is that you shall have no other gods before me, a prohibition of, uh, against idolatry. God and God alone is to be worshipped, but as you know, the children of Israel didn't always obey that commandment. Sometimes they got involved in idolatry and in the worst forms of idolatry. There was an explicit statement, do not have any other gods before me. But when you read the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 7, and this is where I'd like for you to turn, and you know, if you underline in your Bible, this is a good passage that illustrates the silence of the scriptures. In Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 3, God has a complaint against the children of Israel. And he tells the prophet Jeremiah to say this, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways. Amend your ways. Well, what were they doing wrong? Well, the answer to that can be found in verse 31, among other things. They had built high places which is in the valley of the son of Hinnon to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire. Idolatry. Idolatry that consisted of taking their own children and offering them as sacrifices, human sacrifices, to these gods that were not gods. So here's an explicit command. God said, do not do this. Do not commit idolatry. And what are they doing? They're committing idolatry. And so God says, you need, to you need to amend your ways. You need to change. But notice why and how God chooses to condemn their idolatry. Does he say, you are guilty of idolatry because you have, you have violated what I expressly said, thou shalt not commit adultery or idolatry. You know, have no other gods before me. That's not what he uses. Look at his rationale in verse 31. You have, you know, you have built these high places. You're offering your sons and daughters in the fire. Listen, here's why it's wrong. Which I did not command you. 
He didn't say, this is wrong because I said don't do it. He chose to say, this is wrong because I didn't command you to do it. It didn't even enter my mind, he says, that you would do something like this. So what God does here is says not only, well, he says doing what is not commanded is the equivalent of violating what I did command. It's a strong passage on the silence of the scriptures. The silence of God is prohibitive. You don't have any right to do this because I didn't command it. Turn in your Bible to Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, a familiar passage that has often been used to illustrate this principle. You have Nadab and Abihu, and they offer a strange fire to God, a fire that was unauthorized, a fire that the text says was not commanded. And they were punished for it. Now, you can, and people have tried to make, well, you know what, they were probably drunk. Look at verse 9. They are probably doing it in a, in a careless way. Well, all that said, that's still not the basis for their condemnation. They were condemned because they did something that God had not commanded them. That's what the text says. So to do what has not been commanded is condemned. Silence is prohibitive. In Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 8, the Levites are told here to carry the Ark of the Covenant, um, specifically the the Kohathites, uh, which were one of the sons of Levi. They explicitly were the ones who were to to carry the, the, the furniture of the tabernacle and so forth. Well, did God ever say, Simeon, you're not allowed to carry the Ark of the Covenant. And Judah, you're not allowed to carry it either. And Benjamin, you're not allowed to carry the Ark of the Covenant. He never said that. He just said the the sons of Kohath are to carry the Ark of the Covenant. But you know what? When you read in 1 Chronicles chapter 15 and verse 2, That's the command in Deuteronomy 10 that the sons of Levi were to carry the Ark of the Covenant. But here's what, here's a divine commentary on that. Is that, can anybody else do it? What about the people that weren't mentioned? Could they do it? No. Because the divine commentary on that command is given in 1 Chronicles chapter 15 and verse 2, and it says, no man may carry the Ark of God but the Levites. Now, where did he get that idea? Because that's not what God said in Deuteronomy when he gave the command to carry it. He just said the Levites are to carry it. Nowhere did God say that no one but the Levites could carry it. Where did he get that idea? From the silence of the scriptures. The silence prohibited anyone else from doing that. And then... We can go on with the example of Saul at Gilgal, uh, the sacrifice that he made uh, without the prophet Samuel, the the priest Samuel, and he lost his kingdom because of that act that went beyond the authority of God. And then as well, the the, the superiority of Christ over the angels in Hebrews chapter 1, where God says, to which of the angels did he say in verse 5, you are my son, today I have begotten you. The import of that passage is since he didn't say it to the angels, they had no right to claim it. Jesus is superior. Um, Jesus could claim it because God said it. But if he didn't say it to you, you couldn't claim it. That's the silence of the scriptures. Now, some have charged us with being inconsistent they'll say, well, now, listen, if the silence of the scripture is prohibitive, and folks, there's no if to it, didn't we just look at a bunch of passages? I mean, that principle is established in the Bible. Don't let someone say, if, what that, if you're saying, if that's true, it is true. We just saw it's true. This is how Jesus interpreted the authority of God. When God was silent, they didn't act. It was prohibitive. That's how the Bible treats this subject. But now, what do we do with people when they say, yeah, but you have songbooks. I don't read about songbooks in the Bible. 
and you have a baptistry back here. I don't read about a baptistry in the Bible. And you have PA systems and PowerPoint projectors and all that, and I don't read about them in the Bible. Again, there's a difference between an aid and an addition. And you can say that's just parsing words, but it's, it's a point that people need to understand. And if you don't, you will be confused by that. Listen, every command that God gives permits a means to fulfill it. I mean, God wouldn't say, Steve, I want you to um, chop down a tree. Well, if he said that, he's got to allow me the means to, to obey his command. Well, I can't chop it down unless I use a tool. And then I can obey him. So... Every command has some expedience involved in it, but expedience are different than, well, let, let's, I've heard this illustration all my life, but let's say uh, God said, I want you to, um, I want you to ride up there, I'm backwards, turned around, Where, where's the school of preaching? It's this way, okay. Uh, last direction I chose. Um, if, if God said, I want you to walk up to the school of preaching, um, and uh, go up there this afternoon. What would I have to do to obey that? It, it, could I get in my car and drive up there? Because that, that would be easy, and I, maybe it's raining, I wouldn't even get wet. That would be disobedience. Because God didn't say ride up, he said walk up. And that would be me adding to the commandment of God. Now, what if he said, walk up, and I decided, you know what, I have a bad knee, and, and I get a cane, and, and I walk up with a cane. Or it's raining, and I decide to get an umbrella, and I put an umbrella up. Have I, have I disobeyed God if I walk up there? No. Now, he didn't mention those things. At the end of the day, I've done exactly what God said to do. I have walked up there, and I used means to help me aids to help me do it those aids didn't change the command of God at all but a car would have because it changed the mode of transportation and so when I use a songbook what am I doing I'm singing you know in order to sing you have to have words and those words can be put in your memory and stored up here or they can be stored in a loose leaf paper, or they can be stored in a book that you bind and sit in, in the pew in front of you. You have to have words to sing. And at the end of the day, whether I pull those words from my mind or pull them from a book, what have I done? I've still done just what God said to do, to sing. I haven't changed anything. If I use an instrument, I've changed the kind of music, right? He said to sing. And now I'm singing and playing and making a different kind of music other than the kind of music. And listen, folks, some today are actually, and I'm about to wind up, but some today are actually contending that this whole discussion about the silence of the scriptures, the, the whole discussion about authority itself is divisive. And we ought not concern ourselves about even trying to find authority or to search for authority for what we do. But have you considered how far-reaching those implications are? If we don't have to have authority, if we don't have to find the Word of God or have the Word of God supporting what we do, then why would you oppose sprinkling? Why would you, the Bible doesn't condemn that. Why would, explicitly, why would you oppose the baptizing of babies? Why would you oppose prayer to saints? Why would you oppose baptism for the dead? Why would you oppose the office of a pope? Nowhere in the Bible are those things explicitly condemned. If, if we don't have to have authority... And we can do all those things and more. And I'm afraid that that's what we're coming to. I think I may have shared this with you last year, but I have a quote from a preacher who was asked, who was making this very argument, we don't have to have authority for what we do in, in worship to God. 
And uh, the whole notion, he says, is wrong, wrong-headed. We don't have to have authority. So someone asks him a question, and this, this is a good question to ask. So would it be wrong to offer an animal sacrifice to God? Here's his answer, and I'll just go ahead and quote him. He said, only from the sheep's point of view. If, and then he said, if you're honestly from your heart engaging in this act of worship to express genuine thanksgiving to your God, and you both believe this to be acceptable to him, and it's done in such a way that none of your brethren are caused to stumble and none who are lost were hindered from being drawn to the Lord. And if you do not seek to bind this practice on others, then I would find no reason to condemn your worshipful expression. Can you believe that? This is a man who stands in a pulpit and preaches. My, my 12-year-old son knows better than that. Jesus Christ is our sacrifice. What, why would we offer an animal sacrifice to God today? And if a fella doesn't know better than that, he shouldn't be in a pulpit preaching. But that's, that's where you go. When you do away with authority, then you're left to do whatever you want to do. You don't think things will go very far. People have enough common sense not to get too far out. I hope you'll go home and do this. I, I shared this with my mom and dad and uh, nephew this morning, but about a year or so ago, a couple years ago, uh, the North Richland Hills congregation um, in uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, decided that they were going to add instrumental music to their worship. This is the largest church of Christ in, in the nation, probably in the world. And they decided they were going to make that step. Go home if you get the chance. Go to their website and watch their October 4th worship service, Sunday morning worship service. Get to the end of it, the last 10 minutes, and watch what happens. Um, not only do they have a band playing, a guy with guitars, a girl playing a keyboard up here on the stage, but then they start, you know, this, this singing, the noise is loud, and, and these kids come running down the aisle, they're jumping up and down and dancing, and they jump up on the stage, and they all have their hands up and dancing and swinging each other around and, and yelling and shouting, and they're encouraged to do it by the preacher. And then the preacher passes out party favors to everyone in the assembly. You know those things you, you blow on like a gazoo and then has the, the little thing that goes, you know, out? And he says, blow on this to the glory of God. And so the whole church is blowing party favors and this thing going out and just a, this huge celebration that they called worship. How would you condemn that? if we don't have to have authority. And is that the picture of worship that you see in scripture? Can you imagine Moses, Aaron, and the sons of Aaron approaching the tabernacle of God with a party favor and telling all Israel to blow it and, and jump up and down? Silly. Can you imagine the scene, how different it would be Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 is given a glimpse into the throne room of heaven. The smoke is thundering, the voice it makes the pillars shake. And Isaiah, in the presence of God, falls on his face and says, I am undone. I'm in the presence of God. I'm a man of unclean lips. I can't live in his presence. And an angel came down and, and touched his lips with a hot coal and said, You're cleansed. And then from that point on, God said, I need someone to go for me. And Isaiah, feeling the sense of humility and indebtedness, says, here am I, send me. That's the scene of worship and reverence that, that I see in Scripture. And we need to have that same reverence to God. Reverence to God is shown. Well, Jesus said it this way. If you're my friends, you'll do what I say. And that's true. If you're a friend of God, if you're a friend of Jesus, 
You won't be out there venturing on your own. You'll do what he says. And let's just stick to that. As I close, let me just challenge you and call you as a people to go back to the Bible. Go back and seek a thus saith the Lord for all that we do. We need to speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. And to do otherwise is to depart from God and to no longer be a friend of God. And let me challenge you with the words of a Puritan preacher by the name of Richard Baxter who lived in the 1600s. He addressed this very issue that we're talking about today. And he said this, For what man dare go in a way which has neither precept nor example to warrant it? Can that be obedience which has no command for it? Oh, the pride of man's heart that instead of being a law obeyer will be a law maker. For my part, I will not fear that God will be angry with me for doing no more than he has commanded me and sticking close to the rule of his word in matters of worship. But I should tremble to add or diminish. I think those are wise words. And I think that we too need to have such a reverence for God and his authority that we might tremble at the very thought of adding to or diminishing aught from what he has spoken. If you're here this morning and um, you look at your life and examine it and decide, I, I need to make some changes, or I want to rededicate myself to the cause of Christ, I want to be stronger, more faithful in the future, uh, in just a minute we're going to sing an invitation song encouraging you to, to make that step, and we'll pray with you and for you to that end if that's your need. If you need to respond, think about it as we sing this song, and if you need to respond, come to the front.